On today's episode of the Yezu the Radio Show podcast, we start a multi-part series talking about the Yezu DR2X repeater. Kind of deal with the history and some other things on today's episode that people may not be aware of. And that's for today, Wednesday, January 10th of 2024 on the Yezu the Radio Show podcast. And welcome to the Yezu, the radio show podcast. I'm your host, John Crook. Thank you for tuning in. We're back in the studio today here. Our last podcast, the first one we did for the year, we were doing some things in the studio. We kind of got it back up and running here. So we're once again simulcasting, double broadcast. I don't even know what term you want to use for it. But we're doing this as well on the podcast stream here, as well as going ahead and taking a look at it on, if you want to view it on YouTube, which is the video version of the podcast here. You see me moving around the studio and doing a couple things like that in there. So if you want to see us, go ahead and tune into our YouTube channel, yezuusaofficial.com. You'll see that video posted there. Otherwise, you can always subscribe if you're watching on YouTube on our Podbean stream. And if you don't want to download the Podstream Bean, our Podbean stream app, don't worry about it. You can go ahead and it is broadcast out through the other one's distribution on there. So as I said, for today's podcast, we are going to delve into uh, basically a little bit about the DR2X. And the reason we wanted to do this episode and, and kind of a couple of different episodes is people were really kind of unaware of some of the things of the DR2X. They know it's a repeater and they know that's what it is really on there. But I don't think people realize the in-depth features of the DR2X, which for some that's okay. You're not going to need it and anything like that on there and you may not. But then for others, it's like, oh man, hey, no, I want to I wanna know this. I want to know some of these features. So that's why we're going to do a multi-part series here and we're going to get it started for you here now. But before we go ahead and dive into that, people always ask, you know, they say, hey, John, I want to buy a DR2X. Where can I buy a DR2X? Well, if you are located in the North America market, and unfortunately, if you're watching this outside of the North America market, I'm sorry, this isn't going to apply to you. But if you are in the North America market, as at the time of the recording of this podcast, January 10th, 2024, you can partake in our Yezu System Fusion Repeater Program promotion. That's right. You can get one of these DR2Xs that we are talking about today for either the cost of $700 or $900. That's correct. Only $700 for a brand new DR2X repeater with a three-year warranty. Three years, folks, three years. Not a lot of people are aware of that. Some people think it's only one year. Nope, three-year warranty on it. And if you want to pay the extra 200 bucks, you can get that land card built into there, which allows you to do digital voice messaging on there. So you can record a message into the repeater, send it out, or you can connect with other land users on there. So a lot of functionality in there for an inexpensive price. I'm not going to say cheap price because these are not cheap, okay? These are not cheap quality. People say, you know, why? Why can you offer there? the reason we offer these prices is because we want to be able to help the clubs. We want to be able to help Fusion. And more importantly, we want to help for the MCOM user. What better way to have a spare repeater for $700? If you are interested, head on over to our System Fusion website to download an application. That's at http colon forward slash forward slash systemfusion.yezu.com. Once again, the word systemfusion, all one word, dot yezu.com. On the main homepage there, you can click that link. The program is valid up until March 31st of 2024. Alrighty, now diving into this big topic of what we talked about here is the DR2X. And one of the things about the DR2X is it, it is the second generation of the Yezu repeaters. There was a version that did come out before that was the DR1X. But... I think to start off this multi-part series, it's best that we can take a look at the history of the Yezu repeaters. And the reason I say to take a look at the history of the Yezu repeaters is because some people don't realize how long it's been out there, where it came from, and those kind of things. So what better way to go ahead and start this series than to talk about it? So what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time, okay? As we could say, picture it. 2013, 2013, the big announcement comes out from our VP at the time, Dennis Matzenbacher, who says, hey, we got this new digital voice technology out there. 
it focuses on digital voice. It's because it's digital voice. It's not digital data. We have enough digital data modes out there and everything like that, but it's digital voice. Now, what's going to happen with this digital voice is, is that you're going to go ahead and take, and we're going to have it use C4FM. We're going to have it use it FDMA technology, proven good characteristics of digital voice technology, current characteristics of digital voice technology. Alrighty. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to release at that time, we were releasing a mobile, we were releasing a portable, but soon after they released the DR1. Now, it's the DR1, not the 1X or anything like that, the DR1. And the DR1 was offered as a promotion to clubs. So what you had to do is you had to, as a quote-unquote club, write in, fill out an application saying, Hi, we are a, we are a club. We want to go ahead and use Yezu System Fusion, and we want to purchase this repeater at a discounted rate. Okay, and what happened was is that you were able to get the repeater at a discounted rate. Now, what did that discounted rate get you? Well, that discounted rate got you basically into the entry level of the Yezu System Fusion repeaters. And in turn, what we did is is that, and this I, I think this goes to a testament of how we do things with Yezu, to go ahead and show that we were interested in what the customers wanted as feedback as to what it to do, how to do this, how to see this, that kind of thing. So if you were part of the beta program, you had to fill out some information, purchase the repeater, and then what you did is, is you got the option to submit quote-unquote feedback. Let's just call it feedback. And what that feedback was is it allowed us at Yezu to say, okay, wait a minute here. And this is what people are seeing. This is how people are using it. This is this and this and this and this. Now, what happened in that case then, what ha what was good is, is that we got feedback from them to then be able to release or produce the DR1X. Now, the DR1X, when it came out, was designed in essence to be a standalone repeater. Okay, it didn't have the ability to be connected to the HRI 200 physical connection. It didn't have that. It didn't even have the ability to have a feed like an HRI 200 fed into the repeater. It didn't allow that. Now, the reason it didn't is because when we introduced Fusion, right away out of the bat was the Wires X aspect of it. So Wires X, we've talked about in different episodes and stuff like that, came out of Wires 2, right? But what we did is we added the flavor of going ahead and having the, in, in essence, the, the, the digital side of things. Because Wires was allowing for analog connectivity, copied some of that same concept and core principles, but we added digital and we changed a couple things on there. That's a different episode. We've talked about that before. But it was designed to be a standalone repeater. That's what it was. You put that repeater up, you put it at a site, it's digital, digital voice in, digital voice out. All righty. It took somewhat of the concept of how people reported back to us saying, yeah, no, we just want to go ahead and we just want to have it as a standalone repeater. We don't want to link. We don't want to do nothing. We don't want to da 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 So that's why we made it the way that we did. Now, when, and this is kind of the interesting part of it, I guess. When the One X came out, it went along and provided functionality that the One didn't have. So the One was really designed, once again, kind of almost a beta thing to do this and this and this, no external controllers, no nothing. It just uses a standalone repeater. Well, people said, I want to include remote control. I want to, like, as an, I should say, controller, right? I want to include a controller. I want to do this. I want to do this. There's no beeps. There's no boops. There's no this and this and this, right? So we said, okay, fine, 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 fine. No problem. So we integrated and we made that active D sub 15 connector on the back of that more active, okay? We turned it on. So now people can integrate a controller. People can integrate whatever they wanted to into it, right? The controller, whatever, whatever, whatever. We had on the back, we had a 10-pin mini DIN port on there. Now, that 10-pin mini DIN port was more so designed to be for firmware updates and that kind of thing like that on there. It wasn't designed to be what it has progressed or can be used for today, which is Wires X and a couple other things, right? But what happened was is that people were saying, you know, like, okay, cool, this is great, this is great. But then as soon as the 1X opened, because now with the 1X released, we were able to say, okay, here you go. Here's what it is. Here's the repeater, your club, group, or organization, 
okay? You n- Individuals were not part of it, which, eh, okay, that, that's neither here nor there. It's a long time ago. That that has come and gone. But that's what it was. It was, as, hey, you, you have to be a club. You have to be a group. You have to be an organization in order to buy these repeaters. And they were at an inexpensive cost, about 500 if I remember correctly, five or 600 something around there. But then you could do that. And then the, anybody could buy that through the program. You could buy the repeater worldwide. And a lot of groups and clubs started to take advantage of it. Because they were saying, hey, great, now we have a digital voice technology which concentrates on voice only, right? High-quality digital voice. That's what the Fusion Protocol is all about. It's not about data. It's not about data and voice. It's about voice, okay? With small little things you could do with data, but no large share of files or anything. Once again, that's that's another episode of what Fusion is all about. We've talked about that numerous times. So what happened, though, is, is that we said, okay, fine. Clubs, groups, organizations did it. A lot of them were buying it. A lot of them were enjoying it. And as time went on, people started to say, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see this, okay? Well, what ended up happening is is that people started saying, I want to be able to link. How can I link? We said, what do you mean you want to link? They said, well, I want to link. If if I got a digital repeater over here, all righty, and I got a digital repeater over here, and we want to link them together. We want to link them together and, and be able to communicate. Well, we said, okay, well, you can do that with the analog aspect of wires X to the repeaters. No, 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 no. We want to be able to link, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to be able to link in digital. Uh, okay. I guess that's a feature that people didn't, weren't, were like, hey, da, 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 da. Now, the one problem that it kind of came to, so, so people can understand where this came from, is, is that wires X and the actual DR1 repeater, operate at the same level. So there's levels in the Fusion protocol. There's the user level, which is your mobiles and your portables. And then there is like the repeater infrastructure level, which is like the DR repeaters and then wires X. And then there is the networking layer of the infrastructure. Now, as part of the Fusion protocol, if you're aware of it or know, and you've heard me say this numerous times, a, a repeater cannot repeat a repeater. Back in the day, a digital signal infrastructure could not repeat or retransmit a digital signal infrastructure. So at that point in time is what ended up happening is, is that you could have a repeater, but the wires X unit would not listen to it or a repeater would not listen to the other repeater. It wasn't. And the reason being is once again, it comes down to the, I'm going to make a copy of a copy. So I have an original something, right? Whatever. Okay. In, in instructions. Okay. For this is just for wires X show that we're working on later. But it's like, okay, I have instructions. This is my original copy. I'm going to put it on a copier. I'm going to make a copy of that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the original, set it off to the side, take that copy I just made, put it on the copier, and make a copy of that copy. Now I'm going to take that copy, copy A we'll call it. We're going to throw that away, and then we're going to take copy B. We're going to put that on the copier, and then we're going to copy copy B, which is going to make copy C, and do it over and over again. Eventually, the, 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 the picture, whatever you're doing, the copying is going to be crap. That's really what we want to do. It's going to be horrible. So that's why we said, okay, hey, here's the deal. That can't repeat it. Now, the reason this is significant is, is because you could put a Wires X device on the air and you could not go ahead and hear or repeaters transmissions, <clears throat> but you couldn't talk to it in digital either. The repeater would ignore the HRI 200 in digital and the HRI 200 in digital would ignore the DR1X. So what ended up happening was, and it was a beautiful Christmas gift because I I wasn't with Yezu at the time, but on the Christmas Eve, December 2020, 2014 is what, yeah, 2014, a little firmware came out on the Yezu website and it was there for a short time, really short time. And what it was, it was for the HRI 200. And what that firmware did is you updated your HRI 200. When you updated your HRI 200 with that firmware, now what it did is it said, hey, guess what? I'm not functioning as a device anymore. Like, I'm not in that same level. What I am doing is, is I am functioning in the level when I'm connected to a radio, I'm functioning like a user radio. And now what would end up happening is, is that you could use the HRI 200 in digital to talk in to the DR1X. Now that made things great. It was amazing because now you had digital linking. 
You had digital linking there, and it was great. People enjoyed it. People loved it. And it was, it was something that really started to enhance the repeater usage because now users of repeaters could start linking together. Okay, they could do that and all using Wires X. However, people were still a little upset. And people were still a little upset because they said, you know what? I have to have an HRI 200. I have to have at the time they either had the FTM 100 or the FTM 400. I had one of those two radios. So I got a radio and an HRI 200 and a computer all tied up. And then I got to send it over the air. I don't like that. But I have internet at my site. So can we go ahead and can we make it so that I could take my HRI 200 and directly connect it to the actual repeater itself? And that's where it came up with version 1.10. So version 1.10, before we were always on version 1.0, but version 1.10, so version 1.10, then took it up to this next level. This took it up to the level of saying, now you could directly connect an HRI 200 to it. You need to put it into HRI mode on the repeater, or you could still do that connection of what you had over RF. And we left it open that way because guess what? There are going to be some people who liked having it set up by RF because they don't have the site at the internet. They don't want that equipment at the internet, or I'm sorry, at the site, even though they might have internet. But then others have said, I don't, I, I, I don't have to worry about it. It's great. It's fine. It's done. Who cares? Who cares? So that's where people went along and they said, okay, now we have an option. And then starting in 2015, 110 came preloaded on the repeaters. 110 could not just be firmware updated. And we'll cover that in a minute. But usually when people start to hear about the HRI 200 and the radios that can do with the HRI 200, what it is, people say, well, hey, what's this and this? And how do I do this? How do I do this? Question even came up the other day. And people are saying, hey, how can I feed my repeater with PDN functionality, all that stuff, because WiresX has also progressed. That's where I'm going to tell you to go listen to our podcast on Podbean or go ahead and take a look at our YouTube channel, Yezu USA Official. We have more videos coming out. We have more education coming out. Or better yet, if you're at one of the major events we're going to be at, like Hamcation, Hamvention, Huntsville, other sort of events and stuff like that on there, we are running Yezu educational programs now. That's right. We're not going to go ahead and do the horse and pony shows and everything like that when we do presentations. No, we are providing and bringing educational content to you. So even if you're going to a show and stuff like that, make sure you look up when we might be doing a presentation because it's going to be educational. And it's not just the shows either. We have events scheduled coming up at our dealers. That's right. HRO, different locations. Giga parts, others like that. Check in. We're going to be making announcements. Check on our social media. Or, hey, guess what? Even if you can't make an event, even if you're not going to make one of those, you say, John, I want my club to have an educational event or something like that. Make sure you contact me. Contact me via email at j.kruk at yezu.com. Once again, j.kruk at yezu.com. And if you want an educational seminar or session to be brought up at your group, hit me up. We can do it online. Or if it's big enough and we have a couple situations where a schedule might open, we may even be able to fly out to your group and do it from there. Once again, reach out to us. We want to help make sure that you're educated on Yezu product. Alrighty, so now... We did that 110 firmware update, right? With that 110 firmware update, came from the repeater, it's fine. However, you needed to do it differently, and it was more than what could be done in the field. So if you had a version 1.0, you wanted to go up to version 110, you had to send it in to us. Now, there were some people that um, said, oh, you could do the 110. Um, some people I know that are quote-unquote reviewers for different publications and stuff like that, put out YouTube videos, and that's not the case. People were able to put 110 firmware into the repeaters, but they didn't hit all the areas that needed 110, and there were special parts of the repeater that needed to be accessed that could only be done internally at our f facility, right, in Cypress, California. And if you'd send it to us, we would go ahead and do that firmware update back then, and then they, we would send it back out. That's since, that's since changed, okay, because the DR1X is no longer in production, 
All right, and we'll cover that all here in just the last little bit of the um, podcast program here today. So what ended up happening was is that ones that had 110 could hook the HRI 200 directly to it, or you send in your DR1X, get it updated to version 110, comes back to you, and you could still do that. So a lot of people are happy about it. They said, great, now I can go ahead and do this. But one thing came about. People are saying, you know, John, it would be nice if the DR1X could do this and this and this and this. Well, what we quickly found out was is that there were limitations in software and limitations in firmware of what people wanted in the repeaters. But we were hearing people. We were taking their suggestions down. We were going ahead and saying, okay, they're asking for this. They're asking for this. Let's write these notes down and see what we can do. And if it was going to be able to be implemented software-wise, we could do it. But if a software limitation took place, forget it. We weren't going to be able to do it. If a hardware limitation was going to be put in place, definitely forget it. We weren't going to go ahead and be able to do it. Alrighty. So then what ended up happening is, is that in about 2017, we started to work on the DR2X. So this was the second generation of the repeater. And the second generation of the repeater was really fantastic because we took some of the things that people were saying, and then we also added other features that people really didn't per se ask for, but have found since that's a great idea. So the couple of the biggest things I would say between the DR2X and the DR1X is is the DR2X has dual active receivers. Some of the people went along and they said, you know what? Hey, I want to be able to have an ability to do a con- an RF link, a control, some quote unquote backdoor into the system. I said, oh, okay, fine, that makes sense, right? But it had to provide control. And then they wanted control with DTMF. Because with the DR2X, you couldn't, or excuse me, DR1X, you could only use it using our enhanced page coded system, which basically is a combination of sending CTCSS tones um, through there in, a, in an order fashion, da 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 da. But with the DR2X, you can now do it in DTMF, or what we added that people didn't ask for but said, hey, that's a great idea, is to be able to do control with Fusion Telecommand. That meant registering a radio with a repeater, a mobile radio, and then you could take it, send commands from that radio into Fusion format, and then it would go ahead, be received by the repeater. It would only be received by the radios that were received or registered, I should say, with the repeater, and then it would execute those commands and functions on there. So a lot of people said, hey, that's great. We also went along and we made it that people who wanted to link but didn't want to use the Internet like Wires X requires you, you could use the LAN option. Now, that LAN option really <laughs> took right off because what happened was is people said, you know what? For Wires X to take place, I have to have a computer. I have to have an internet connection. I have to have UDP ports open, and I have to have a global non-natted IP address. doesn't mean static, but it means an actual e- e- IP address that goes out to the internet directly. Doesn't get goes through firewalls or natted within like you know your cell phone companies or anything like that. And then if you connected it to a repeater, that's great. But then if you couldn't connect it directly to a repeater, then you had to go ahead and use a radio, with tied into an HRI two hundred. People didn't like that. They said, I want to be able to link my repeaters together. I have internet access, or I can get internet access. I don't want to have to open ports. I don't want to do this and this and this. Boom. That's where the land card came into play. So now people are be able to just basically put in an Ethernet, and then when they plugged in Ethernet, plugged into the um, router, your Internet provider, whatever, whatever, and boom, you were good to go, okay? That was a great feature on there. Other features kind of came about with the DR2X, which was continuous duty of 50 watts. Yes, the DR1X could run at 50 watts. It could, But if you had heavy traffic times, you had to go ahead and have good cooling on there. And people didn't kind of realize that. They kind of didn't really want to say, you know, like, oh, wait a minute here, I have this and this. They thought they could just put it in there and run there. Plus also, too, is is that you really got to practice good repeater ownership and good repeater practice. You know, you, you should have circulators. You should have good quality duplexers. You should have this and this and this and this, right? Okay. But the DR2X could. And what would happen with the DR2X that had a feature on there that basically you can basically put a prick on the PTT button and that would go ahead and do it. And if it got too hot, then the repeater would fall back to the next power level. If it got too hot from there, then the repeater would fall back down to the next power level. So you could be at 80, 50 watts. Hey, whoa, it got too hot. It's going to drop back down to 20. If it's still running too hot, it's going to back drop down back to 5 watts on there. 
The other thing that the DR2X had is, is that it had more of a robust interface on the D-Sub-15. One of the things that people did complain about with the DR1X is, is that you have basically three modes of operation with the DR1X. You had FM only, you had digital only, or you had AMS. But if you tried to interface anything on the DR1X through the D-Sub-15, you would then have to select a mode of operation. You'd have to select it to fix FM or fix digital. If it was AMS, it wouldn't transmit whatsoever because the repeater wasn't smart enough to say, I got to automatically default. That was part of the memory issues. One of the things that came out with the DR2X is, is that if you're in AMS mode and if you're going ahead and having it in, in, in whether it was controlled with the repeater or using that D, uh, 10 pin mini DIN for transmit, then it would go ahead and AMS mode would always default to FM transmit. So now people are saying, hey, this is great because now if I have an external link or something like that coming in for usage, those analog users can come in. The repeater sees, hey, I'm getting an external source for PTT. Now what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to default to FM in AMS mode. So great, great, great features on there. And then it had alt uh, other alternative features on there. So, for example, you could do split CTCSS tone. So have one CSS uh, CTCSS tone for receive and a completely different one for transmit. You could have split split tone mode, which would be like DCSN, CTCSS out, or flip it. You also had tone and CTCSS, where you could send a 1000, uh, 1050 hertz, sorry, I think is what it is. The, like, the standard key up tone would go ahead, wake up the repeater, hear the tone, and boom, you could do that for FM. It had digital only mode, obviously, they could do in there. But now the DR2X was part of Yezu System Fusion 2, the second generation which is that little symbol you see up in a lot of our stuff up there. But that also allowed for DGID operation. Now, what DGID operation allowed you to do is it allowed you to go ahead and say, okay, hey, here we go. Now in digital, I could actually start to kind of steer my transmissions. So instead of in back in the days when with the DR1X, you had basically no really way to do selective access. You could now with Yezu System Fusion 2, the second generation, and usage of DGID. You could use the DGID sort of like, and I'm going to say this understandingly, like it is an analogy, not the same situation, but like a quote CTCSS tone. So when you're in FM, if you have your CTCSS tone, encode and decode turned on, you're only going to transmit that CTCSS tone. And you're only going to receive that CTCSS tone. So if I'm on 100 hertz and someone's transmitting a CTCSS tone of 141.3, not going to hear them. Same thing with Fusion. Fusion with the DGID. If I'm listening on DGID 10 for transmit and receive and someone's using DGID 20, not going to hear them. They go to switch to DGID 10, I'm going to do it. But what also DGID did is it allowed for the linking using that LAN card. With the LAN card, we had to have some way to help steer to the different groups of repeaters. And that's where the DGID, digital group ID, comes into play. Okay, It's not a talk group. It's not. Okay, But it allows you to steer and group things together, to connect things together. All righty? And DGID doesn't need to always be transmit or receive. You could just transmit a DGID. You could just receive a DGID. So a whole bunch of things. we got other episodes to cover about that, but getting back to that. So with that now, now we have the DR2X. Now lots of different great advanced features on there. The second generation. But there were some people who still liked the DR1X that wanted a quote-unquote like Aries Races machine, an MCOM machine, a backup machine. So what we did at that time is we had the DR1XFR program, so the factory refurbished. So what we did is we said, hey, here you go. Hand in a DR1X. We're going to give you credit for it. Had to be working, had to be this and this and this. Send it into us. We'll take it in on trade, give you a, a discount on it, and then what we'll do is we'll sell you the DR2X. Now, once again, this program has ended. It was before. We'll give you a DR2X at a discounted rate, and then what we would do is we would factory refurbish, and then people could buy a DR1X factory refurbished, right? Great. Grand. So now what people were able to do is they were able to go ahead and buy a DR2X, and they were able to also go ahead and have a backup repeater, have another repeater if they wanted to, because they could buy an um, XFR unit on there. Well, since then, 
the XFR program has ended, the DR1X um, ended production, and we're still in the DR2X realm. So that's the current edition of the repeater. But we're going to end it here for today. And the reason we're ending the podcast here for today is because the next episode, we're going to start to talk a little bit more of the concepts of the DR2X. <clears throat> what is out there, how it can work, how it can operate, how there's different functions and features into it. And to to start to dive into only part of it is not going to do it any justice. So with that being said, thanks for tuning into today's podcast. I want you to definitely go ahead and make sure that you tune in and subscribe or watch other for the remaining parts of this segment. I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised at what the DR2X does have to offer. Um, it built into the repeater standalone and what else you can go ahead and do with it. So until then, I want everybody to take care, stay safe, 73, and we'll catch you on down the log.